Today, the time has come to get started on the Amiga 2500. I can't wait to get this thing up and running. This should be easy. <sighs> yeah, right. I am so excited to start the restoration on the first of the local TV station's video toaster Amigas. I've decided to start with the Amiga 2500 because it looks to be in pretty good shape. I've wanted a big box Amiga for most of my life, so now's the time to fulfill that dream. In an earlier video, you saw Nurse Julie and I transplant a Video Toaster 2000 from the Amiga 3000T into this machine. After the operation, I immediately removed the toaster and put it into an anti-static bag in a safe place, so you won't see it when this machine is being disassembled, but worry not, it will be going back into this machine after the restoration. I started out by pulling out the power supply and checking it for reefa caps or any other serious issues. There's a slightly bulging cap, but nothing looks too bad, so I've decided to risk a test power up after I make a list of all the caps I need to order. There's always a slight risk in powering up before a restoration, but I vastly prefer to start out knowing where I'm at. In this case, there were no pops and no magic smoke escaped, and I was pleased to see a kickstart screen. It has errors trying to read from a floppy, but this machine is doing well, all things considered. This really should be a piece of cake. I'll remove all the add-on cards and store them safely in anti-static bags in a sturdy box. Next, the inner frame that supports the power supply and drives has to come out. Flipping the lower case over, I notice a missing foot, so I'll need replacements for those in addition to the caps. As I was sitting at the desk, I just noticed how bent this case is. And the motherboard itself is also bent, so we'll have to fix that too. Time to pull out the motherboard for my first good look. It's an earlier version 4.4 board. I guess to get a good look at the bottom, I first need to get this RF shield off too. It's held on by the port connector screws. It looks like the only way to get this off is to bend it away on one side also. So now that it's off, let's see what we can see. The bottom of the board doesn't look too bad. I can see a little bit of flex residue and it looks like one of these ports has been replaced, but overall not too bad. I think the important thing here is that I don't see any sign of battery acid leaking through to this side. You know, I have a ton of these big ESD bags and I've never found anything too big to fit in them until now. This board is so huge, I actually had to cut down two of the bags and tape them together to make one big enough to fit it in. Moving on to the inner frame, I first removed the power supply. Next, I removed the plate the hard disk and floppy are attached to, then removed the drives themselves. The hard disk is insulated from the frame with a piece of paper. It looks like the hard drive controller has some corrosion issues that will have to be dealt with later if there's any hope of recovering data from the drive. The floppy drive looks pretty good, but it had problems when I tried to use it, so we're going to need to go through it as well before we're through. So it's a few days later and my cap orders come in, so it's time to pull the power supply back open, this time for a full restoration. I quickly made sure the caps were not charged, and then I pulled the board out of the PSU for better access. The fan looked like it had been replaced at some point, so I connected it to the bench power supply for a quick test. It sounds really good, so since the replacement fan I ordered was defective, I opted to clean and reuse this one. After brushing out all the loose dust with a detailing brush that was slightly dampened to prevent static, we add a little flux and fresh solder to each cap's contacts before removing them. I did have to change to a heavier iron tip for some extra thermal mass on the heavy ground plane on this board. I'd already made a detailed list of each cap's position, value, and polarity. What a work of art. Once the caps were removed, I found that the board was extremely dirty and there was a small loop of loose wire in the connector that was screaming to cause a short circuit. After removing it and giving the board and case a good scrubbing, I soldered in all the replacement capacitors. 
A quick check of the voltages using an old hard disk and a disk drive as a load looked good, so it gets closed up and dated for future owners. There are a few issues we'll need to deal with on the motherboard. Even though it seems to be working fine, there's a lot of corrosion around the battery and the processor socket has seen better days. There's also a ton of dust and grime that needs to be cleaned. Overall, this should be a quick and easy repair. Quick and easy, huh? What a maroon. To start out, I want to do a good inspection. I find that it's easiest to do a little cleaning to make sure I can see what I'm working on. It's also time to get the processor out of its socket so we can see how badly it's corroded. The answer is not bad. It should clean up nicely, although it's pretty grubby. The socket, not so much. I absolutely love the Motorola 68000. It's my favorite dip chip of all time. Yes, I have a favorite dip chip. I even designed a basic Motorola 68000 based computer as a college project back in the day called ALF for Advanced LED Flasher. Unfortunately, we never built these designs, but I've saved the project and hope to build it one day. I can also see some small signs of corrosion to the traces under the processor. So I make a list of issues to resolve as I go. I don't want to forget anything in my desire to get this beast up and running again soon. I decided to tackle the processor socket first since it looks like it'll be the hardest part of the project. You have no idea. I start by cutting away the braces between the socket halves and cutting the socket into segments of about five pins each. I started out with one segment as a test. As usual, a bit of flux and fresh solder is first added to each pin to get the old solder flowing. It was very resistant in the areas with the most corrosion. Next, I used a desoldering station to clear as much of the solder from each pin as I could, followed by solder wick to get as much as possible. There were a couple pins that did not want to release, but it was now possible to get to the top of them with the iron and get them out. The old solder was still not wanting to clear from the holes, so more fresh solder is added, followed by the desoldering station and solder wick to get them cleared. The next segment was the most corroded and proved a bit challenging. I eventually got it off, but the first couple pins were the most corroded and would not release from the top of the board. Unfortunately, when it finally came loose, it took a trace with it, so we'll need a bodge wire from pin 2 to the nearby resistor pack. The remainder of the socket was not affected by battery corrosion and was relatively easy to remove. I would guess I spent as much time on just 4 pins as it took to remove the remaining 60 from this socket. After the socket was off, the pads on the board needed to be cleaned on both sides of the board. It just takes solder wick and a little bit of patience. I'm very careful that no pin gets heated for more than about 10 seconds at a time, and now the area can be cleaned with swabs and alcohol, and we get our first unobstructed look at the condition of the traces. There are clearly issues with the traces under the socket nearest the battery, along with the area immediately around the battery. The damaged areas need to have the solder mask removed to expose the copper beneath. The corrosion has gotten under the solder mask as seen by these dark spots. They all have to be exposed and cleaned to prevent the corrosion process from continuing to do damage. The solder mask around the battery area also needs to be removed and the pins from when I cut the battery off are in the way so they gotta go. The remaining solder mask removal was a bit laborious so let's just take a look at the state of the board after about an hour. I eventually broke my scratch pin, so I will do a little touch up later once a replacement arrives, but overall this is looking pretty good. I think I'm going to remove all the caps now just to get the rest of the removals complete and be ready to build things up. Each cap is removed with the same recipe that the pins on the socket were. A little flux, a little solder, and a dash of heat, and voila! The CPU is really crusty, so it needs a good cleaning. It takes a little use of the fiberglass scratch pin to get all the goobers off, but it looks pretty good. The ROM was not as bad, but still needed a little work. Now that the demolition is complete, we can start the reconstruction. With the solder mask removed, we have all the corrosion cleaned up, but the bare copper will corrode over time from exposure to the air. To prevent this, we have to add a coat of UV activated solder mask to the exposed copper, then use ultraviolet light to harden the stuff. I don't have a UV flashlight, so I have to make do with this UV fingernail polish hardening rig I found laying about. 
You can also just use regular non-metallic fingernail polish. I am careful to make sure that the pads that parts will be soldered to remain free of mask. If some gets on them, they'll have to be scraped away before the solder will stick. I check the continuity from the corroded traces on the processor socket to their adjacent connections and found a couple that were not making a connection, including the one where I lifted a trace. Before installing any bodge wires, the replacement CPU socket needs to be installed. I'm using a turn pin socket like I preferred back in the day, but a lot of people prefer a double wipe socket for easier soldering. Whatever you prefer should be fine as long as it's not the single wipe garbage that was in here in the first place. I use some fine single strand wire to make the bodge wires and for a retro machine, what's better than a new roll of vintage wire? I like a clean straight bodge run, but one short wire ran over a via too close to the connecting points. I was afraid that heat from the soldering iron would burn through the insulation on the wire causing a short, so it had to be routed around. Next, all the capacitors need to be installed. Each one is placed being very careful to make sure the right values and polarity are observed. The keyboard connector also needed to be removed and cleaned. It had a little corrosion, but thankfully it was minor and cleaned up easily, so back on it went. Before testing the board, I removed each socketed IC and cleaned the socket with alcohol, followed by a light coat of Deoxit D5 with a cotton swab. Oops, I almost forgot. It's time to solder in a replacement battery. This one is a coin cell holder with a built-in diode to prevent the Amiga from trying to charge the non-rechargeable battery. The replacement 2032 cell should last for several years, and if it dies, it's just keeping the date and time, so no big deal. I always start with a clean bench, and I always end up with a massive mess. I just have to be me. One quick final once over, and it's time for the moment of truth. Piece of cake, huh? Apparently the cake was a lie. It looks like I'm just getting a black screen. I check everything over and try again, and this time I'm getting a purple screen, followed by some darker purple noise. The color does look right for a Kickstart 2.0 background, but it doesn't seem to have a sync signal. So at this point, I went down a bit of a rabbit hole chasing video problems that did not exist, probably because I spent the last few weeks chasing video problems on my Amiga 500. Problems that weren't even caused by the 500, but a defective OSSC. I don't want to put you through all the dead ends, so let's just take a quick look at the bullet points and get on to the final solution. So I started by looking at a capacitor near the video port that had a missing pad. I should have started out looking at the schematics because it's a power filter and it was not the issue. I checked all the ferrite beads and resistors around the video port. No problem found. I tried replacing the Denise chip and since the one in my Amiga 500 has an RGB to HDMI with it, I also checked that output at the same time. The RGB to HDMI was syncing just fine, but it had scrolling purple stripes, so clearly the post-Denise video circuitry was never an issue. So at this point, I did try putting the CPU, Denise, Agnes, and Paula into the Amiga 500 to make sure they were all okay. Now this was just really to reassure myself that I hadn't fried a precious custom chip, but thankfully they were all just fine. So this is where I pulled my head out of my arse and got back to the basics. I quickly verified the voltages were all still in good shape, and they were. Next, I took the board into the house while I had puppy sitting duties, and I took a page from Chris Edwards' book. No, I literally took a page and started checking every pin on the CPU socket using Sprint Layout and the Gerbers for the Amiga 2000 and marking them on this printout of the Motorola 68000 pins. Unfortunately, I could only find files for a version 6.2 board, and this is a version 4.4, so I had to make do with what I had. I did have the correct schematics. I'll include links in the description to the files I used, as well as a video using this technique. I ended up finding three additional lines that had breaks in them, one of which was intermittent and looked fine with the pressure from my probe pressing on it, so it was not immediately apparent that it had an issue until I was checking continuity from points on either side of the CPU socket. This also explained why I sometimes got a black screen and other times got a desynced purple screen. So now I've added the additional bodge wires, all of which were in the core of the battery damaged area where I should have been focusing in the first place. So, now to test it again. <laughs> 
Bazinga! We're getting a kickstart screen. Now let's hook up a mouse, keyboard, and disk drive and see if it boots. Hey, we've got a workbench, but the mouse isn't working. And that area of the board has clearly had work done on it before. Let's try booting with the mouse in the other port. Always remember, these are not hot swappable. That was the number one thing I fixed for people back in the day is replacing damaged chips from plugging in things while the power was on. Don't do it. Okay, the mouse is working fine in the other port because I seem to have forgotten that the mouse only works in one port when in Workbench. I ran a bunch of tests using Sysinfo and Amiga Test Kit and everything looked great. So in the next part, this machine will need a floppy rebuild and hopefully we can get the hard drive working. The mouse, hard card, and accelerator will have to be checked out and installed, not to mention the video toaster. I plan to get all that done and more in the next part of this video, which will be right here when it's ready. In the meantime, here's another video you might like. Easy peasy? Yeah, right.